Okay, good morning, everyone, uh, once again. Um, <clears throat> we're going to carry on a topic that we um, got into last week, um, and which carries on a little bit further to the next Mishnah. I just want to do a quick review of the, um, the principles that um, the previous Mishnah taught us. Um, which we learned some Gomorrah as well. Uh, can I just apologize in advance? There is some shiput sim, Israeli style taking place um, in the apartment below us. So if you'll hear hammering, drilling, etc., there's very little I can do. It's coming up through the floor as far as if I can try and blot it out by closing windows or whatever. So I would apologize if I'm disturbed by uh, mechanical noises. So going back, <coughs> the mission that we uh, we learnt on Mem Aleph Omen Aleph, which was in the middle, brought us two takonot of Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai. This is the famous Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai, who um, revived, if you like, Jewish life after the Chorban Beis HaMikdosh, the second temple's destruction. Um, and he did so uh, by ensuring that Yavne would remain a, uh, a citadel for uh, the uh, Sanhedrin, uh, for, uh, for Jewish law, for Jewish study, and that would be a springboard for generating new Talmidi uh, Chachamim, who would be the future leaders of the Jewish people. Even after the destruction of Jerusalem, the uh, continuity of the Jewish people uh, as a, uh, a religious people would be uh, guaranteed by the survival of Yavna and its Chachamim. And Rabbi Gamliel, who was the, the head at the time and who was from the um, uh, descendants of Hillel, the uh, Davidic line. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai is uh, said in this Mishnah to have made two takonot. He made more than two, but the two that are mentioned here, one of them is very relevant to Sukkot, which is why uh, it is brought here in the second Sukkot. And the second one is just brought um, tangentially, really, but we will focus on that second one a little bit more than we will on the first. The first one related to the taking of the Arba Minim during Sukkot. And if I remind you that Minha Torah, um, the Arba Minim are only taken on day number one. That is the Torah only mandates the taking of Lulav and Esrig on day one of Sukkot. During the uh, subsequent six days of Sukkot, um, the uh, Lulav has taken Minha Torah only in the Beis Amigdash, or according to Rambam in Yerushalayim, but not elsewhere, nowhere else in the world, According to many sources, not even anywhere outside the Beis HaMikdash itself. However, Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai, after the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, wished to do, make a Zeicha le Mikdash, a, uh, a commemoration of the Mikdash, so that the Mikdash would always be with us, even when it isn't with, uh, with us. Um, and he instituted that the Lulav be taken all seven days of Sukkot, wherever you were in the world. And when we take the Sukkot, the uh, um, Lulav and Esret there from day two, day three, etc. Um, when we take it, we really should bear in mind we're doing so as a result of this Takona Zecha Le Mikdash. If, if the Mikdash were around, there would be no din to take the Lulav. It would be a one day mitzvah, unless you came to the base on Mikdash, when you would then take the Lulav and Esret with you. Uh, but this institution that it should be done everywhere for all seven days was done Zecha Le Mikdash to eternalize the memory of the Beis HaMikdash. So it was a very important principle for um, uh, Rabbi Yochum and Zakai that we should remember the Mikdash even when it isn't there. Because if we are, we're a people of memory, if we don't remember something, then we make no effort to bring it back again. We, 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 we bring back, we revive Eretz Yisrael because we have a memory of Zion and we have a memory of the Beis HaMikdash. So uh, eventually we will rebuild the Beis HaMikdash as well. So that was the first of the Takonot of um, Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai in this mission was the one that was relevant, really, uh, to, uh, to Mesechet Sukkah. The second one, which was brought in uh, in five words at the end of the mission, that the day of waving should be asur the whole day. This was in relation to, if you remember, the eating of the new crop, chadash. And I brought you a posuk that um, uh, suggested a halacha for all of us, that when, before the uh, Korban HaOmer is brought on the 16th of Nisan, which is when we also start to count Sphere Soma, 
before that omer is brought, the new standing uh, grains may not be eaten. Anything that's ready to be harvested may not be eaten. It, it's only when that uh, carbon omer is brought in the morning of the 16th of Nisan that we may start to eat from the latest harvest that we've brought in. Up to that point, we have to be using eating from the previous year's harvest. So the new crop is called Chadash because it's the new crop. And the new crop is Asur. It is forbidden for us to eat until the uh, morning of um, the 16th of Nisan, um, when the Korban Haoma, which is also a grain Korban, is brought. Now, uh, Minha Torah, that would mean that during the time of the Beis HaMikdash, when the Korban Haoma was brought, um, it was only in the moments following the bringing of a carbon or omu man, if you can imagine, there would be a sort of starting pistol to being able to eat from the new crop. Up to that point in time, you wouldn't be able to. And it was literally from the moment of bringing the carbon or omu. So how do we know when the carbon or omu is brought? Well, if you're too far away, you can assume that by midday, the Gemara said, carbon omu would have been brought. So you know, if you were in the vicinity of Beis Amigdash, maybe somebody would have waved some flags and blown some trumpets to say, hey, we just brought the carbon omu, you may now eat from the new crop. But failing that, you could always assume that it was brought by, by midday. Um, but Rabbi Yochaman and Zaka here made a takana. Following the destruction of Beis Amigdash, there is no carbon omu. So what is it that signifies we may now start eating from the new crop. Well, according to the way in which Chazal alerted the Pesukim, one would be allowed to eat from the new crop already from dawn of that morning. In other words, even earlier than one would be allowed to eat from the new crop when there was a base on Mikdash. When, the, when there was a base on Mikdash, you would only be able to eat from the new crop from the moment that that carbon had been brought, which, which would be by the latest mid-morning, but might well have been mid um, uh, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning. But without a base amygdash, the way they learned the verses meant that you could actually start eating from a new crop from, from 6 a.m., literally early on from when the sun rose. And that would be the earliest time. So that's the, if you like, the base halacha. So here's where Rabbi Yochum and Zachai comes in. He says, he made it to Connor that you shouldn't eat the new crop until the end of that day, until sunset of that day or stars out on that day. In other words, he delayed the permission to eat from the new crop from the morning till the end of the day. Why did he do that? So he said, He had this, this rather strange uh, concern, which was concern that the Beis HaMikdash may suddenly fall down from heaven, so to speak, and be made available to us. And if we eat already from the morning, which is what the Torah would allow us to do when there is no Beis HaMikdash, then the year after, when the Beis HaMikdash suddenly comes down and drops down on us, we may make a mistake. What's the mistake may we, we may make? So um, just prior to the Beis HaMikdash, before it's come down from heaven, if we really kept this Torah practice and said, well, you can eat from the new crop already from the morning, because that seems to be the Beis Halacha, then if the Beis HaMikdash in the subsequent year were to drop down, this is the way the Gemara explained it, highly extraordinarily unlikely, were to drop down somehow from heaven late at night on the evening before the 16th, and it suddenly dropped down and we realized, hey, we've got a Beis HaMikdash, we're going to have to bring the Korban Omer. So all the, uh, if you like, the, um, the Kohanim and their assistants go running out into the fields to cut down from the new crop in order to process it, in order to make the Korban Omer. It might be that given all this rush, they may not be able to fulfill the process until late afternoon on the 16th. And since the people around wouldn't really know that the carbon omer hadn't been brought yet. Indeed, Sami and not even know the base Amikras has suddenly arrived on the scene. They would have started eating already in the morning of that new year, based upon what they did the previous year before there was a base Amikras when they when they ate first thing in the morning. However, given that there is a base Amikdosh, the um, the heta, uh, the permission to eat really only starts when the uh, uh, carbon omo has been brought. So people would be doing the shogay unwittingly in Aveira, they would be eating too early. 
not knowing that the base Ambedkar was there and that the barley offering was only brought a few hours later. So therefore, because of this concern that this event may happen, this extraordinary event may happen overnight on the 16th of Nissan in some future year, Rabbi Yochman Sachai said it's better to be safe than sorry. Instead of allowing people to start eating in any old year when there is no base Ambedkar in the morning, only allow them to eat at the end of the day. That's the safest thing. The end of the day. That way, people who don't know the base Amikdash is there yet, they won't eat anyway until the end of the year and end of the day, the year it's built. And that would be fine because even if the barley offering is brought in the mid afternoon and they delay evening and eating until the evening, so what? That doesn't matter. You don't have to eat as soon. You don't have to eat as soon you, as you're allowed to eat. You can eat a little bit later. So that would be the safe way of operating. So <clears throat> this is all predicated on Rabbi Yochman Zakai's obsession, if you like, with the base on Mikdash. We, we saw that he made a takon of Zeichel in Mikdash, which is let's forever remember that the base on Mikdash is with us and let's also therefore take Lulav and Esrik all seven days. The second takon is, if you like, loosely associated with it, not so much as Zeichel in Mikdash, but rather we so look forward to the rebuilding of the base on Mikdash that we have to concern ourselves with allowing the Hocha for people to eat straight away on the morning of the 16th. Rather, we shouldn't do that because it may happen. It may well happen next year and uh, we will eventually, um, uh, uh, we, we will be uh, causing people to make an error if we allow them to eat at the beginning of the day when the base ambientists are suddenly there and really one shouldn't eat until uh, midday or a little bit later. So therefore, he said, every year there is no base on Mikdash, you may not eat until the end of the day. That's the way we'll explain um, the Mishnah in the Gemara. It's a little bit long-winded, but this is the topic that's not really part of Mesechet Sukkah. It's more topic in Mesechet Menachot. But since it's come into this um, Mesechta, we've had to explain it. And the Gemara um, will carry on on this topic a little bit. But I wanted to take up um, just out the interest really of our, based on a question I received, actually by Yehuda, she sent me this question. I wanted to um, examine one of the presumptions made in the uh, Takona here of Rabbi Yochum and Zakai. This, um, the fear that he has, the base on Mikdash may suddenly drop down from heaven. Um, this is, we're talking about the third base on Mikdash, obviously, and that would lead us into all sorts of trouble. This is what Rabbi Yochum and Zakai was concerned about. So um, Yudit sent me a question. She said, surely no one believes in that. She said, surely we all know that the third base on Mikdash will be built by man. And if the third base on Mikdash is built by man, no one's going to suddenly find it dropping down from heaven on the 16th of Nissan when it wasn't there the day before. I mean, you know, given all the approvals you need by the area before you can build anything, it'll be 25, 30 years before the base on Mikdash is fully built from the time you actually announce that you're going to build it. And certainly it isn't going to be something you didn't know about the previous day and you suddenly find it's been erected overnight. You wouldn't. If it were a man-made base on Mikdash, it would be a very gradual, natural process. There would not be a miraculous fall from heaven. So where does this miraculous fall from heaven come, um, come from? <clears throat> um, and I, I did respond in, in writing to say that, well, you know, that is the underlying assumption of Rabbi Yochan ben Zaka here. This is precisely what he's concerned about. And Tosfos over here and Rashi both say that the first Beit Mikdash uh, will be Mishuchlal and Beyobo Min Hashemai will be, if you like, ready built, rather like Odom Arishan, according to the, the Midrashim, wasn't born as an embryo, it didn't come out as a baby. Who would have, who would have done his nappies up or his diapers, if you're an American, if he were born as a baby? He came down fully made, with hair in his chest, he was, you know, 30 years old, fully developed, and with, with total mental capacity, in the same way the base on Mikdash will come down, fully furnished, carpeted, everything you need, all the equipment you need, 21st century adapted, etc., with all the mod cons. That's the way Rashi and Tosas understand it. And they quote a posuk, which is brought down in Medrash, Mikdosh um, Adonai Konanu Yodecha. Well, that posuk comes from Oz Yoshia. Mikdash Adonai Konanu Yodecha. But just before that, it says, to be aimo, the situ aimo, bahan achalosacha. 
you will bring them, you will bring them to future promise in Nazi Hashem, not looking back. And after all, at the time of Priyas Yamsuf, there wasn't even the first Beis HaMikdash. You will bring the Beis HaMikdash into being, and that, that Mikdash, Konunu Yodecha, your hands, who's your hands? HaKadosh Baruch your hands will have established it. So they say, ah, this is evidence of a miraculous Beis HaMikdash. We know that Shlema Benech, Menech built the first Beis HaMikdash. That was built naturally. We know the second Beis HaMikdash was built by... Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, and then again rebuilt by Hordus, etc. So neither of those were built miraculously. The Mishkan wasn't built miraculously. I mean, maybe with a bit of help from heaven, but Bitzalel spent a lot of time with his uh, workers and his crafts and building the Mishkan. So what does it mean, Mikdash Hashem Kononi Yodel? So therefore they, um, they attribute that to the uh, third the circumstances of the building of the third base on Mikdash. The third base on Mikdash will not be like the first and the second. The third base on Mikdash, so to speak, will survive forever, and it will be, so to speak, built by God's own hands. So that's the Midrashic underpinning to this idea that the um, third base on Mikdash is no film in Hashomayim, completely mishupotsed, if you like, without the need for human intervention. Okay. So why is it that we talk about the Mashiach and everything being natural and the Beis HaMikdash being built um, as a mitzvah for us to build the Beis HaMikdash? Don't we also know about all those other things as well, which suggest that um, it's going to be up to us after Mashiach comes to build the Beis HaMikdash? Do we not know that there is a strong line in Chazal for that as well? And the answer is yes, we do. And this is part of this classic um, <clears throat> difference in view about messianic times and the third base on um, There is this school of, of thought uh, based upon the Medrash I've just explained to you and Rashi and Tosas here explaining Rabbi Yochum and Zakai to say that messianic times will be a time of wonder, wonders and the base on will fall from heaven. But there's another line as well. I'm just gonna share my screen with you and we'll have a look at some of the sources. This is a little bit of a diversion as a result of a question, but I have the limit, liberty to do so under Talmud in Technicolor, so the license I have. Um, when we talk about whether the, the uh, Beis HaMikdash will fall from heaven or not, it is related to this whole idea of Beis HaMashiach, not just the Binyan Beis HaMikdash, but generally the coming of the Mashiach. Is the Mashiach some flying carpet that suddenly arrives in our midst? Or is he someone who comes on the, uh, on the, uh, on the train from Tel Aviv and gets out the station and has to take a cab? What are we looking at over here? And literally, this is the discussion that we find. It's a debate, if you like, between Medrashim, and it's a debate you find in Chazal, and then it's a debate you find in the Rishonim as well. So let's try and trace some of these different underlying uh, sources. <clears throat> Well, here's one of the sources I've just highlighted it for you from the book of Daniel. Now, the book of Daniel is almost impossible to understand anyway. And this particular verse is in Aramaic. Says Daniel, I saw in a dream at night, and I then I highlighted, I saw a man come. He appeared to be a man, but he was, if you like, floating on the clouds of heaven. The Ad Atik Yumaya Motta, Katamari Kavra, he came up to the throne of Akadish Baruchu. And the next verse says, What about this man? Who are we talking about? The Lay Yahav Shultan, the Yakal, Malcho, Homamaya, etc. Look at the translation. Dominion, glory, and kingship are given to him. All peoples and nations of every language must serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship one that shall not be destroyed. So Chazal say this refers to the Mashiach. Daniel had all these uh, visions of Mashiach, a lot of even the timing of his coming in very mysterious terms. We didn't understand his calculations. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, many of the commentaries have tried to understand the book of Daniel to give us an insight to the coming of the Mashiach. They've tried it for thousands of years and they haven't come up with a, an explanation of what Daniel was trying to say. But over here, he has a vision of the Mashiach. And the Mashiach is one, if you like, I've highlighted here in yellow, like a human being, he translates it. I'm not sure if it's like, maybe it's, he is a human being. 
came with the clouds of heaven. Well, that sounds, as I say, this is the magic flying carpet version of the Mashiach. He gets, he gets brought in on the wings of an eagle. This is the miraculous Mashiach version from the book of Daniel. Now let's have a look at a posset from Zachariah, a very famous posset as well. Unfortunately, it's not come down properly from the source I downloaded it. You've got this strange uh, few words in the middle. But in any case, um, it says, Hine malach yovolach. Behold, a, a king, malachich yovolach, is coming to you. Ma'od bas tzion, hari bas Yerushalayim. Shout out, daughters of Jerusalem. Sadik, the noshahu. He is a tzadik and he will be saved or will become the savior. He's oni verochev al chamor. A very famous expression. He is a poor man, a beggar, and he rides in on a donkey. Raise a shout, fair Jerusalem. No, your king is coming to you. He is victorious, triumphant, yet humble, riding on an ass, on a donkey foaled by a she ass. Okay, so he's an oni verochev al chamor. He is a uh, a poverty, impoverished man, and he's riding on a chamor. This is the other view of the Mashiach. He's not coming in on a flying carpet. The Gemara explains this posuk to be referring to Yomos HaMashiach. When the Mashiach comes, he comes in as an impoverished individual on a Haredi bus from Ramat Beit Shemesh base, crowded with lots of people, people are stepping on his toes, and he gets off the Yerushalayim bus stop. That's the vision of the Mashiach's coming that we see here from Zachary, very different from the one we saw in Daniel, where he seems to be riding on the clouds. So this is the sort of natural um, Mashiach, the man made the Mashiach, who's gonna to have to do a lot of things by hand, so to speak, as opposed to the Mashiach who's coming in on a cloud. Very different, um, uh, uh, aspects and perspectives of the Mashiach. There's another, um, <clears throat> take you to this one. Again, the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, Rabbi Yishim and Levi said to Eliyahu Hanovi, he meets him, and he says to him, Eimat Osi Mashiach, when will the Mashiach come? So he says, Amale, he answered him, Leil Shayan Elidideh, go and ask him yourself when he's coming, says the Mashiach. Says Rabbi Yohanovi, who will proclaim the Mashiach? He's not the Mashiach. He says to um, uh, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. So, so, so says Rabbi Yeshua Levi, Beheicha Yosef, where is he sitting? I want to ask the Mashiach, when is he actually coming? But I don't know where to find him. So he's told, Apischa de Karta, he is sitting at the gate of the capital. What does that mean? We understand that to mean that he's sitting at the gate of Rome. Look at the, intro, in, in the translation over here, which is a more of an explanation than a translation, so it's better. At the entrance of the city of Rome, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi asked him, and what is his identifying sign by means of which I can recognize him? When I sell outside the gates of Rome, there are crowds of people. How will I know when I've seen Mashiach? So Eliyahu answered, he sits among the poor who suffer from illnesses. By the way, the Christians have sort of used this a little bit to say that uh, Jesus is the Mashiach. You can see why they say this sort of thing, you know, that he attends to the poor, etc., etc. Anyway, he sits among the poor who suffer from illnesses, and all of them untie their bandages and tie them all at once. But the Messiah unties one bandage and ties one at a time. He says, perhaps I will be needed to serve to bring about the redemption. Therefore, I will never tie more than one bandage so that I will not be delayed. Well, you can imagine the commentaries go to town to try and understand this extraordinary medrash, but it's a medrash about the Mashiach. Here again, the Mashiach is on the lines of the Mashiach we read in Zachariah, Ami the Rechev al Hamor. Very much the same idea, the impoverished Mashiach. Here, the Mashiach here is a pauper sitting at the gates of Rome, who is medically attending to the bandages of the disadvantaged lepers and everyone else outside. That's what that's, This is the Mashiach we're talking about over here. Again, not on a flying carpet. Again, a very different vision and perspective of Mashiach. He's, he's doing chesed. 
and he's, he's tying and undying bandages one at a time. According to one explanation, what that means is he's doing things in a natural sequential way, that when the Mashiach comes, he won't wave a magic wand and then all of a sudden, uh, rather like the Wizard of Oz, you know, Yerushalayim will be turned into some scintillating streets of gold. It's a gradual process of deliverance. This is the Mashiach uh, in this particular Gemara from, from, from Sanhedrin and Peruk Chelem. So you see all these different perspectives of Mashiach, miraculous, not miraculous, an ancient of God acting as if he were impoverished. And these lines come through to the, to the building of the base on Mikdash as well. Um, I'll just give you a, as another famous statement. This is by Gemara in the Gemara. This is the statement of Shmuel in the Gemara on which the Rambam bases his view that the Mashiach's coming and the base and the building of the third base on Mikdash are all man-made events. Eventually the time will come when we are worthy and we produce a leader and that leader will have the confidence of the people and then he will have a number of, of mitzvot to organize in terms of the rebuilding of the base on Mikdash. At the time of the Mashiach, the only thing according to this view, and it's accepted by the Rambam, but not by many other commentaries, is that the only difference between the coming of the Mashiach and today is the fact that Jewish people will have their independence in their land and they won't have to set up um, uh, their missile sites around the country to prevent um, uh, attacks from, from, from outside. They won't need to have an army and an air force and whatever it is. They will, we will all live happily, we'll be able to eat our bread in peace and quiet, uh, we will be relatively well off, although there will still be poor people. The Gemara says, Lo yechtal evyen mi kereboretz. It's not as if everybody will straight away be living in a villa, it will not be the case at all. This is a naturalistic coming of a Mashiach, as from uh, Shmuel's opinion in the Gemara, and this is the way Rambam understands this, and Rambam, of course, in his commentaries, also goes through the various pirushim in Tanakh that suggest that the time of the Mashiach, bread will grow on trees, all these, you know, the lion will lie with a lamb, etc. These stories, he reads them in a sense where they have, they're a moshal and an imshal. They're proverbs, they're not, their analogies are not taken to be literal changes of nature. It's not that the lion will suddenly become meek, or the lamb will suddenly become fierce, or that fruits of the tree will suddenly come off with, you'll be able to pick off your bread loaf, rather than having to reap the, the grain and make it into bread. None of these things he sees. He sees a continuation, but a word, world where we will have the freedom to do what we wish. It's a naturalistically evolving messianic world. And this is perhaps the way in which Hirsch also saw some of these. He, he was seeing the world already moving towards this and a number of other, um, uh, commentaries, but they are probably in the minority, not in the majority. This is not going to shift. Where do we, so where do we go from all this? How, how do we reconcile these different views? You could say, take a view that they're not reconcilable. There are two completely different world views. One is the worldview of the miraculous oncoming of Mashiach and Binyan Beis Amikdash. Uh, the third base on Mikdash. And the other one is of this naturalistic evolution. And you will find Psukim, and you will find Agadot in the Gemara, and you will find Rishonim, who comment on those Gemaras in relation to both of those. If you take, I guess, the um, center of gravity of the Orthodox world today, then it probably has gone more to the supernatural view uh, and moved away from the natural view. And that's the way we are today. I think that's where the preponderance of thought is. And maybe there are other historical reasons and social reasons why that should be the case. However, if we are uh, of a community that believes more in the Rambam and, and rationalist commentaries uh, of Soloveitchik, probably also slightly more Hirschian, then we would move more towards the naturalistic, to the um, um, rational view um, and of the man-made view for the Messiah and the Beis Amikdash. However, well, let's come through circle, uh, a, a full circle again to um, where we are in our Gomorrah. We've seen very clearly 
that based upon Rabbi Yochum ben Zakkai's Tokonot, he was of that view, the supernatural view, that it falls down uh, and lands there overnight. I just want to say that there is a view, um, just stop sharing, that tries to view, to fuse these opinions, to, to create some sort of reconciliation, which is to say that these things will happen naturalistically, but those uh, apparently naturalistic means, means, I mean, not supernaturalistic, but rationally and slowly in a man-made fashion. However, since um, this is only going to happen with Siata de Shemaya, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to, so to speak, help us at every step. So to speak, he is guiding the footsteps and all the processes if you like, that happen in the world behind the scenes. So you have got something, you have something in between. It may be that the Mashiach will bring about a society which rationally is able to live in peace with each other. But given the way we are as human beings, that would never be possible without a Kodesh Baruch who's in current and behind the scenes. Uh, and we would never be able to build a base on Mikdash again on Har Habayis without, you know, a, a full scale world war against the Arabs again, without HaKadosh Baruch Hu's encouragement behind the scenes. So, so to speak, HaKadosh Baruch Hu manipulates events. So even if we do things in a way that seems to be in, in a gradual evolutionary basis, um, then that is only on the surface. Behind the scenes, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in command. So that could be some fusion between the miraculous view of all these uh, events and the, um, the rational view. Okay, I, I'm... As I say, I've gone off topic over here, but it's a very important topic in terms of Hashkafah. And I think as Jews and as religious Jews, we always have to be open-minded. I don't think we should be close-minded on anything. I don't think we should be close-minded on the miraculous falling from heaven or on the rational view if we happen to be Hasidic or whatever it is. So many people are, are somewhat close-minded. Um, I think you're allowed to have your favorite line, take a line that satisfies you, but um, the ship in Ponim La Tora, and you should not feel in any way constrained to accept a view. If there are two views and they're both acceptable, you accept the view which you, which you find uh, works best uh, within the culture that you are uh, raised in and, and in your background. Well, I'm finally going to get back to the Gomorrah. I try to avoid getting back to the Gomorrah for as long as possible, but it looks like I'm going to have to return to topic. Um, where we were, was uh, a few lines from the bottom of Daf um, Mem Aleph Omer Aleph 41a. Um, uh, we actually, on the third line from the bottom, um, a few words from the end, which says, Rav Nachman by Yitzchak Omar. There's an Omar just before uh, Rav Nachman. That's actually a mistake. That's why it's in, yellow, in, in, in round parenthesis, preserved in the text, but in round parenthesis means that it's, it's not to be said because um, it doesn't read properly. You start Rav Nachman and then by Yitzchak on the penultimate line. Rav Nachman by Yitzchak, Omar Rabbi Yochum ben Zakkai, Omar Rabbi Yochum ben Zakkai, Bishitas Rabbi Yehuda, Omar, to Amin Ator also. Now here, the Gemara, according to Rav Nachman by Yitzchak, makes a complete about term. What is the about term? Yeah. All the way through, we have just accepted, we said very clearly, We've said very clearly that um, Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai made a takona on the uh, on the time which you could first begin to eat your new crop, and he said that had to be at the end of the day. Why he made that takona? Because even though he accepted that minhat Torah without a base of mikdash you may start to eat from a new crop at the beginning of the day, but because of this possible error that might uh, proceed because when the base of might be built the next year, you might eat it too early. He said, let's keep it all the eating till the end of the day. He made a takana. What does it mean he made a takana? It means he made an enactment, a rabbinic enactment. Had it not been for that rabbinic enactment, that's what a takana is, you would have been able to eat from the beginning of the day. That's the base halacha, when there's no, uh, no base amikdash. However, with his rabbinic enactment, he deferred that earlier time uh, until the end of the day. Says Rav Nachan by Yitzhak, you know what? This explanation that was given before is incorrect. 
Now, we're not necessarily saying it is incorrect, but we're saying according to Rav Nachman by Yitzhak, it was incorrect. So let's now take it forward. Rav Nachman by Yitzhak Oma. <coughs> One second. Um, <coughs> find it here. Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai, they shame Rabbi Yehud Amra. When Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai said that they should only eat from the new crop from the end of the day and not the beginning, he said it in the, in the Shittas Rabbi Yehud Amra. He said it because he was following the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda. To Amar, min Torah who also, who holds that it's forbidden min Torah to eat from the end of the day. According to Rabbi Yehuda, when there is no base on Mikdash, you may not allow to eat the new crop from the beginning of the day. That's what we said was allowed before. Akun Rabbi Yehuda, no. Akun Rabbi Yehuda, when there's no base on Mikdash, you have to wait till the end of the day. And then when Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda and Zachai said in the Mishnah, she hey, kol hayom hanach kulo osa, he was referring simply to the Torah rule. He wasn't instituting something new at all. The Gemara is going to ask in a moment, that doesn't make sense, because in his Loshan, he said Hiskin, which means he was instituting something new. But let's just take things one, one thing at a time. Says Rabbi Nachman ben Yitzchak, Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai's statement that the whole day should be Osa is simply following the Torah line. But when there is no Beis HaMikdosh, you obviously can't bring it when the Omer uh, up sacrifice is bought because there is no way this sacrifice. You've got to wait until the end of the day. Rabbi Yochum Sakhe was just telling us that. that when there is no base on Miklash, you wait until the end of the day. Why would he have said that, that you wait until the end of the day? Here the Gemara is going to bring you a source. Dirsiv, because the Torah says, to Oma min ha Torah, oh, sorry, it says in the Posik, ad etzem hayom hazer. Now here we're moving on to 41b. If you've uh, printed out the sheets, uh, uh, it's on Mem Aleph from its base. Ad etzem hayom hazer. Let's see what this means. At itzumo shel yom. Until the that day itself, the kosova ad ad bichlal. And he holds, Rabbi Yehuda holds, that the word ad includes the day itself. Let me share screen. What's what's this talking about? So I'll try and show you that in fact. You can read something that seems clear two different ways. This was the source verse I brought actually last week for not eating chodosh until the um, uh, the omer korban had been brought. It says um, until that very day, reading the translation, until you have brought the offering of your God, you shall eat no bread or parched grain or fresh ears, i.e., of the new crop. It is a law for all time throughout the ages in all your settlements. Until you bring that offering, you may not eat of a new crop. What, are the, what was the wording brought here? Ad etzem hayom hazeh. Until that day, until you brought the carbon. Two expressions. Until, until. Now, at haviachem es ha carbon will refer, will refer to when there is a base amigdash. When there is a base amigdash, you can start eating from ad habiachem as a carbon. But supposing there isn't a carbon. So according to Rabbi Yehuda, then you have to read those early words to determine when you can start eating the new crop from. Ad etzem hayom hazem. You may only start eating it, you may not eat it until etzem hayom hazem. So I brought these few words here because they are so important. Lo sochlu, you may not eat of that new harvest, ad etzem hayom hazer, until that day. What's that day? The day, by the way, is the 16th of Nisim. It's very clear from the next posseg. So therefore, as I've written down, the new crop is forbidden until 16th of Nisim. Does this mean that it is even forbidden on the 16th? How do you read until? It's an ambiguous word. If you think about it, if I say to you, you're not going to be able to borrow my car, you won't be borrowing my car until the 15th of March. That could mean that even on the 15th of March, you won't be borrowing my car, because the main you may not borrow includes until and including. On the other hand, you might well think it means that you can borrow my car on the 15th of March, because my, un my until starts the night, the night before, the day before. How do you read it? 
ad etzem hayom hazeh. Does that mean that the lo sochlu is even including the etzem hayom hazeh, the whole of the 16th? Or does it mean that already from the uh, dawn of the 16th, the iso achila comes to an end? So it depends how you read the word at. I, I know you could say to me that in normal semantics, you understand what this means. It would mean already you could start eating from the morning. But that's not necessarily true. If you just look at it grammatically, not what your normal semantic interpretation might be, it could include the 16th as the lo sochlu. The sochlu may, lo sochlu you may not, it could prevail through that day entirely until the end of the day. The prohibition could run until the end of the day. And that is Rabbi Yehuda's opinion. He says, ad the ad bichlal. The until and including that day, you may not eat. And therefore you can't eat in the morning. And therefore it's a Torah law because this has come from the Posuk. Rabbi Yochanan Zachai didn't need to make an institution at all because that was the basic law of the Torah according to this interpretation of Rabbi Yehuda. That's what Rabbi Nachman by Yitzhak is saying. That the Torah itself implies that you can't eat until the end. And it's not an institution. Look, I'm always going to say later on, why does he use the word it's an institution? We'll come to that in a moment. But the way he understands this, there's nothing new here. There's no chidush. You shouldn't eat because the Torah suggests through the word ad you shouldn't eat. Now, when you go to the Gemara and when you see many different drashot of the Gemara, you'll see very often this word ad is a sore thumb word, until. You probably thought the word until is fairly straightforward, but it isn't. In a legal document, it isn't really either, unless it's really explained whether the word until includes that day as being prohibited, or is, the first day, is, it, is it the first day of the release of the prohibition? It's not clear. And there are two ways of expressing it. Over here, um, the Gemara says that Rabbi Yehuda held, ad ba'ad bichlal until and including. However, in some other droshot, when the Gemara explains a posset, what it means, it says, ad below ad bichlal, up to but not including. How you learn when this prohibition ends depends upon whether you read until and including or whether you would want to read it until and not including. So over here, Rabbi Yehuda holds this until including, Therefore, says Rabbi, Rabbi, Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda would say that min Torah, when there's no base on Mikdash, you may not eat until the end of the day from the new crop. And therefore, when Rabbi Yehuda and Zakkai says the whole day is also to eat from the new crop, he's no more than reiterating the Torah position. It's not it, nothing to do with Mehera, Yubona, base on Mikdash, and all those wonderful explanations we gave before. It's simply a Torah law. Forget everything we said before, according to this. It is simply a Torah law. Just before we go on, I just want to um, point out something to you, which is a slight problem. Again, if you like chronologically, we said that Rabbi Yochanan and Ben Sakai was really giving you the view of Rabbi Yehuda. And Rabbi Yehuda says that ad the ad bichlal, even only until the end of the day. Uh, you may only eat from the end of the day from the new clock crop. And for Rabbi Yochanan Ben Sakai was just following that opinion. There's a bit of a problem here chronologically. Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai was from the first generation at the time of the destruction of the Beis Hamidosh. He saw through that generation. Rabbi Yehuda was um, a generation, maybe even two generations later on. Rabbi Yehuda bar Eloi. That's not Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, but Rabbi Yehuda bar Eloi. How can Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai be expressing Rabbi Yehuda's opinion when Rabbi Yochan ben, Yochan ben Zakkai is saying this in the year 90, and Rabbi um, Yehuda doesn't make his rule that we've just explained that it's at the end of the day until the year 160. You can't quote someone who's going to, who hasn't been born yet, can you? So the way the commentators explain this, when we say that Rabbi Yochanan says this in the view of Rabbi Yehuda, it doesn't mean that Rabbi Yochanan Zakkai was quoting a view he already knew expressed in the name of Rabbi Yehuda because he hadn't been born yet, Rabbi Yehuda. What it means is that Rabbi Yochanan Zakkai was already of the same view that Rabbi Yehuda would express in another 70 years time. I make mention to this as a technicality. When you learn Gomorrah sometimes, that you seem to come across what seems to be a mix of generations, and sometimes they seem out of order. And you've got to know how to read the Gomorrah 
chronologically. But anyway, the, the message is the same, that according to Rabbi Yehuda and the way the Rabbi Nachman by Yitzhak is learning Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai, when he says you may eat from the 16th, he's no more than re-expressing, reiterating the Torah view. It's got nothing to do with the fact that it, it's really mutter from the morning, but because of the fact that the real view of the base on Mikdash may be built suddenly the next year, there might be a mistake. Nothing to do with that at all. This is a Torah view, very simple and very plain. That's what Rabbi Nachman by Yitzhak says. So it's a different view into the... Uh, um, um, uh, the, the, the reasoning behind Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai when he says Yemana Mota, is it because he made a takona which was completely fresh, which is what we set up to now, or is it because in fact it's always the Torah view, which is this, this new uh, ex, um, argument we bring in the name of Rabbi Nachman by Yitzhak. Anyway, <clears throat> but the Gemara, the Gemara now will challenge straight away that Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai and Rabbi Yehuda are of the same view. According to what we've just said by Rabbi Nachman by Yitzhak, Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai was only just expressing the same view as Rabbi Yehuda, that Minato, you can't eat until the end of the day, says the Gemara that can't be the case because we have a quotation from elsewhere that suggests this is not the case. Is it really possible to say Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai holds that same view as Rabbi Yehuda? You're trying to merge them. How can you do that? We know that they argue on this, the Tanam, because we learned in the Mishnah in Menachos, this is not our Mishnah here, but another Mishnah that seems similar, not our Mishnah. Mishnah Horeb Beis HaMikdash, from the time that the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, Hiskin Rabon Yochan ben Zakesh Yom Hanaf Kolo Oso, that says the same as our Mishnah, but it's part of another Mishnah. Rabbi Yochan ben Azakeh made the Takana that the whole day would be Oso. Um, Amar Rabbi Yehuda, but Rabbi, so Rabbi Yehuda said, no, that can't be the case. But hello, min Torah hu also. It is also min Torah. Rabbi Yehuda and Zachary, how can you say that you need to make a takona? They're not talking to each other. As I say, they live generations apart. You can imagine this is a sort of um, Mishnaic organized dialogue between Rabbi Yehuda and Zaka and Rabbi Yehuda. Again, one of those eye-opening things you only find in the, in the Talmud, where you have people talking to each other as if they were talking to each other because they're expressing views which are at odds with each other, and it's easier to put them alongside as if they were in a dialogue. So it says Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda said, how can you say that there's an institution you make to make it also from the end of the day? Bahalo minatora also. It's actually also from the end of the day already minatora. Dixiv ad etzem hayom hazes, which I've seen, ad etzem hayom until that end of that very day. So we see from here that far from Rabbi Yochum and Zachary expressing the view of the Torah in line with that of Rabbi Yehuda, they're at loggerheads with each other. Rabbi Yehuda says it's Minat Torah, but over here you can see from the Mishnah, Rabbi Yochum and Zachary saying it's not Minat Torah. He's actually being his skin. <clears throat> He's made a fresh takana. They argue with each other. Don't tell me Rabbi Yochanan says it's Minat Torah. You can see very clearly over here. He's arguing with Rabbi Yehuda who says it's Minat Torah, that you can only eat at the end of the day. So it says the Gemara, here the Gemara tries something out. Rabbi Yehuda who took toy, says the Gemara. Very strange. It says that the Gemara wants to say, well, this is really when Rabbi Yehuda says that you're wrong, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, that it's really uh, actually Minat Torah. Rabbi Yehuda made a mistake himself when he was questioning Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai. Huda Kotor, Rabbi Yehuda had misunderstood Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai, who saw amid Rabbon and Kama. He thought that Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai was saying that it was Osa mid Rabbonon. And that's why he said, no, says Rabbi Yehuda, it's Minatera Osi, below he. But he was wrong in assuming Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai said it was Osa only with Rabbonin as a Takana, with a Raisa Kama. So says the Gemara, he, he actually says the same as Rabbi Yehuda. So the Gemara is saying something strange. When the Mishnah seems to show Rabbi Yehuda interjecting and saying, Rabbi Yehuda and Zakai, what are you saying that Yom HaNaf is Kula Osa because you've made a Takana? It's even Osa Min HaTorah. Says the Gemara, when Rabbi Yehuda said, what are you saying that Yom HaNaf is Kula Osa um, um, as a result of Takana, Rabbi Yehuda was wrong. He never, Rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda didn't mean to say that he had made a Takana. 
he really meant to say that he was instituting the Torah position. So Rabbi Yehuda is not arguing with Rabbi Yehuda Mitzach at all. Rabbi Yehuda thinks that Rabbi Yehuda Mitzach is arguing with him, but he's not. Rabbi Yehuda Mitzach also holds it also the whole day in our Torah. And when he said Yom Hanaf Kul Asa, he meant even in our Torah. Rabbi Yehuda thought he meant only Rabban, and so he said surely it's also in our Torah. But they both actually say the same. You know, sometimes you misunderstand someone, you interject, you say, I don't agree with you at all. And by the time you've sorted each other out, you find they both said the same thing, but you just misunderstood what they're saying. There was never an argument between you at all. That's what the Gemara is saying. Finally, the most important thing, the Gemara says, how can you, the Gemara's coming back again and saying, now, come on. How can you say that Rabbi Yehuda misunderstood Rabbi Yochanan and Zakai, and Rabbi Yochanan and Zakai really meant even in Hatera? How can you hold how can anyone suggest that Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai, when he says Yom Hanaf Kula Osa was referring to the Torah and that he was in alignment with Rabbi Yehuda? Read the words of Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai. He says, Hiskin Yom Hanaf Kula How do you understand Hiskin? What, is, what does Hiskin mean? Hiskin means to institute an enactment. A takana is an enactment. Every enactment in the, generally when you look through shas, is a rabbinic enactment. I don't refer to a mitzvah in a Torah as a takana, right? I don't say, by the way, there's a takana to put tefillin on in the morning for men. Who would ever use such stupid language? I would say there's a mitzvah. If I say there's an enactment, it's a bit like I'm quoting something that the area has suddenly set up saying that, Diskin Street is going to be enclosed for the next 24 hours because they're uh, repaving the surface of the road. That's an enactment. Some authority somewhere has decided to say, as they will do tomorrow, that half the roads in Yerushalayim are closed because of the marathon. That's an enactment. There's no Minat Torah. There's no statute book on the Knesset that says you're allowed to close the Knesset. But the mayor's saying that because he's running the... That's an enactment. That's an, an artificial new law brought in which, which, which is in addition to anything that you have to do as a result of a fundamental law. That's an enactment. It's over and above. Rabbi Yochum and Zakai said that he, the Yom Hanaf Kulo Osa is as a result of an enactment, which means that Minat Torah would be mutter to eat. He disagrees with Rabbi Yehuda, but he's enacted because Mehero Yubona based on Mikdash, because of the fact it may lead to an error, as we explained all the way along, he made an enactment overriding that Torah Gaheta, which only allows you to eat to the end of the day. Isn't it very clear that that's what the word Heskin means? And this is, after all, the, uh, the problem that we have now, that his Loshan was very clearly one of enactment. I'm not saying it's awesome in Atur. How you can you now say that he meant in Atur? So the Gemara, strangely enough, is going to try and fiddle in the final words before the next mission. I wanted to reach, reach, reach this, the center of this Gemara. My Hiskin, says the Gemara, yes, I know Rabbi Yochan and Ben Zakai use the expression Hiskin. And I know you want to convince me that Hiskin means a rabbinical enactment. That I mean, I tell it's okay, but Rabbi Yochan and Zakai said, I'm going to enact that you can't eat until the end of the day. But what it really means when it says Hiskin is Dorash the Hiskin. He expounded the verse and instituted the interpretation. I've been very precise in the way I've tried to explain it over here. The Hiskin is not an enactment. The Hiskin is the application of an interpretation of the Torah. That's what the Hiskin means. It is a bit like saying, by the way, there's a mitzvah to put on twillin, but it's very clear there's a mitzvah to put on, put on twillin in the morning. You wouldn't call that an enactment. But if you're trying to interpret the words of the Torah, which aren't very clear, and you are doing so, shall we say, for the first time in some way, then you are derish it. You have to expound it the way you think it should be read. It's a Torah rule. And then you have to act on it you have to enact that the people will apply themselves based upon that interpretation. So it's an enactment only in that you're enacting the Torah rule. This is very troublesome, I have to tell you as an answer, but that's what the Gemara is saying over here. 
So what, it's not clear, because as I showed you the verse, the way we understand that you can't eat until the end of the day is by saying, ad etzem hayom adzeh, a contra Yehuda means ad the ad bichlal. Ad means that the prohibition extends all the way through, but that's not clear. I could easily have said the opposite, that the prohibition stops in the morning. But according to Rabbi Yehuda, he learns that Ad goes right until the end of the day. So therefore, it requires, first of all, an interpretation to state that what it really means is Ad until the end of the day. Someone has to be derish that. It doesn't come out of the translation of the King James Bible. Someone like Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai has got to make a drasha to say that means Ad for Ad Bichlal, like Rabbi Yehuda. That means until the end of the day, it's also. Awesome. Only at the end of the day can you eat from a new crop. So that Rabbi Yechem Zaki had to do. Having done that, you have to ensure that people accept your interpretation. Because until that interpretation is publicized, people don't know about it. That's the hitkin. The hitkin means to publicize and to enact the interpretation that may not have been known up to that point in time. That's what it means. That means the hitkin. That's how the Gomorrah is fiddling it. So over here, we are not dismissing Rabbi, Yechen, Rabbi Nachman bin Yitzchak's view that Rabbi Yechem Zaki all along held that this was a Torah thing, and it wasn't to do with Mehari Yibana based on Mikdash. You've got two different interpretations now on what Rabbi Yechem Zaki's reason was for enacting the end of the day. Is it because he always felt that it was a Torah rule and he just needed to make sure everyone kept it. That's what we've just ended up concluding. Or is it because he believed really that you could already eat at the beginning of the day, but because of this risk, Meheri Yabana Beis on Megdash, and people might make a mistake, that he deferred it until the end of the day. The second explanation over here that we've just said, that he's interpreted and then enacted Hiskin, goes against most of the uses of the word of Hiskin. Uh, normally, his skin is referring to a rabbinic enactment and not one which is an interpretation of a Torah mitzvah. So it's problematic, I have to say. That the the Gemara's final defense of this view that he agrees that the whole day is also min Torah, the need to distort the meaning of his skin in this way is problematic. But the Gemara has left it as that. In other words, the Gemara has accepted that they might be possible to construe Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai's language this way, that he was merely applying um, his interpretation. And he, you could use the words Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai in that sense. I'm going to stop my... Uh, um, I've lost out. Where, where do I stop it over here? Okay. Stop the recording.